영국 케임브리지 대학에서 역사학과 철학을 공부했고 1993년 소설 왜 나는 너를 사랑하는가로 데뷔 2003년 프랑스 예술문화 본장과 기사 자기를 받았고 유럽에서 가장 뛰어난 문장가에게 수여하는 사르르베이용 유럽 에세이상을 수상했다. 여행의 기술, 불황, 일의 기쁨과 슬픔 등을 통해 인생의 양면성을 인문학적으로 풀어가는 이야기꾼. 2008년 영국 런던에 어른들을 위한 인생학교를 설립, 배움을 실천으로 연결하는 대안을 찾아가고 있다. 학교에선 절대 가르쳐주지 않는 것. 알랭드 보통의 이야기가 STF에서 시작된다. 디지털 시대에 더 행복한 세상과 더 살기 좋은 미래를 만들기 위해서 과연 어떤 준비를 우리가 해야 하고 어떤 마음을 가져야 될지 지금부터 기조 연설을 통해서 한번 들어보겠습니다. 알랭드 보통 씨를 모시겠습니다. 나와주시죠. 박수로 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하세요안녕하
it was not necessarily through the most emotionally significant organizations. It was people who made houses, who did transport, who were involved in heavy industry. But at the end of that period, we were still just as confused as we had always been about how to lead a relationship, how to find meaning in life, how to find a sense of perspective and calm in a busy world. These are still areas where we are very, very un, uh, uh, unexperienced. We have no commercial mechanism that sits on top of these large questions. And this really interests me. It interests me as a writer and as someone who increasingly looks at business and thinks that one of the great challenges is to get business to make money out of those needs which previously had just been in the hands of writers and poets and priests, the needs of the higher self. These should also be areas of business investigation. The modern world drives us crazy. It drives us crazy in two central areas. Modern, the modern vision of success is based around achievement in two areas, love and work. Now, these are two wonderful areas and also very challenging areas. You know, for most of human history, it was expected that a job was good so long as it paid you some money. That's all you wanted from a job, just a bit of money. Nowadays, that is not enough for many people, people particularly with an education. They want that a job provides you with money, yes, but also with meaning with a sense of purpose, with a sense of enjoyment and creativity. That's what people want from their jobs. That's very difficult. Take the area of relationships. For most of human history, people had no expectation that they would love the man or woman that they married with. This was just somebody that they would raise children with, do some farming with. It was not someone who had to understand them. But now, we live in a world where you're supposed, and this is just extraordinary, you're supposed to love your husband or wife. Who here loves their husband or wife? Anybody here love their husband or wife? A oh, few people, but many not. So, we have a problem. We have a problem. Some people are married, but they don't love their husband or wife. This is the modern crisis. Who here loves their job, not just for money, but for the passion? Who would do their job, even if it didn't pay them anything, because they just love it so much? Put up your hand if you just love your job so much. A few people. So you see already we have a problem here in Seoul today. We have many people who are married but not in love. And we have many people who are at work but they're not in love with their work. And yet the modern dream is love at work and love at home. So we are in challenges and this is why we need help. And this is why I write books and this is why I think and this is why I started the School of Life. And this is why I think we need some work to do. We have some capitalists in the room, and capitalists are always saying things like, how are we gonna develop a new phone or a new smart app or a, a new way of transmitting data? Listen, capitalists, look at the problems in this room. They are problems that are psychological. Samsung makes wonderful phones. When is Samsung gonna stop making phones and invent a device that will help marriages to go better? Because it's fantastic. The new Samsung phone is terrific. It helps me to speak to my grandmother and far away and send pictures. But this is useless compared to the true challenges of how to live with another human being. Samsung has not explored this. They should. I rec recommend that Samsung develops a psychological division that explores the human being and tries to make technology that is not only impressive and beautiful and elegant, but is also useful to the deepest part of the individual. At that moment, the promise of technology will properly have come to fruition. And the promise is this, machines that can properly help us with the challenges of uh, uh, life. I think we need a new vision of education. You know, up until the 19th century in Europe and a late, little later in uh, a Korea, but the same phenomenon happened. Education was in the hands of religion. It was religions who educated us. And they taught us uh, standard skills, reading and writing, but they also taught us how to be good and how to be calm and how to be kind. And then suddenly people stop believing in religion. And what do they believe in? They believe in romantic love, and they believe in making money. And in the evening, they watch television and use the internet. This is the modern world. It's not enough. 
If you base a society simply around romantic love and work and the internet, you will have craziness, you will have suicide, and you will have low-level depression. In other words, what we around the modern world are having right now. Now, this crisis began long ago. It began in Britain, the world's first industrial nation, in about 1850. This was the moment when suddenly more people didn't go to church than did. First time in history, more people did not go to church. And suddenly there was a feeling of crisis and many intellectuals came together and they said, what are we gonna do? How can we have a society where how are we going to find consolation, meaning, morality, a sense of purpose, a sense of kindness and community? Where is this gonna come from if we just chuck away religion and we just have science, technology, money, romantic love. And some people said there is an answer, and the answer lies in culture, in the humanities, in the visual arts, in poetry, in philosophy, in literature. This is the solution. Culture will replace scripture. And it's, this is the reason why we have so many museums in the modern world. You know, in the modern world, you go to every city, ah, oh, the museum, have you been to the museum? The museum is like the new church. And why? It all comes back to the idea that maybe culture can save us. This is why people love going to the theater. And serious people always say, have you been to the theater? And uh, especially if you have a daughter and she doesn't quite know what to do, not so much sons, but if you have a daughter, you might say, why don't you go and study literature? Very nice thing for a young lady to do, a little bit of literature. This is useless. Culture is not going to help us in this way. If I go to the Museum of Korea and I say, I am in crisis, I cannot find meaning, I, my life is lost, I'm thinking of suicide, I, my soul is full of sadness, the kind of problems you used to bring to a priest. If I, say, if I bring this to the museum, uh, they will say, my goodness, please leave the premises, you are crazy, we are just trying to show some pots from an ancient dynasty, please leave the, the room, we are not giving you the meaning of life. So then I go to the university and I say, I'm lost, and I need the meaning of life, and again, they will say, this is not for you. Um, and I go to the nice lady who is studying literature, and I say, can literature change my life? And she will say, well, the examination doesn't tell me that this is the case. So in other words, there is nowhere to go. We have endless places to go, to buy clothes, to go on holiday, to learn about bioengineering. But if I want to go somewhere serious, I don't want to meet a man with a beard, with sandals, up in a hut, uh, who will teach me something from uh, one of the ancient religions. If I want something elegantly delivered, where do I go? Nowhere, this is the crisis, this is the opportunity. The, pro the opportunity to educate the modern human soul. You know, we have so much wisdom out there already. We have wisdom for the next thousand years. But the problem is, where is that wisdom and are we accessing it? There's bits of wisdom in the university, but the university does not talk to society. There is bits of wisdom in the minds of philosophers, but philosophers don't come on television and they don't come to conferences. I'm an exception. Um, <laughs> Michael Sandel and I are making an exception, but basically we don't. We are stuck in our studies with beards and we just speak to a narrow uh, uh, elite. So where do you go? Who is doing this stuff? We need transmission of wisdom from the cave to society. Wisdom is in the cave, we need it transferred to uh, uh, society. Um, and we need your help, because this is a creative and technological uh, uh, challenge. Um, I think one of the most useful things one can do is to study how religions educate people. Even if you don't believe in religions, I don't believe in religions, I'm very interested, I don't believe, but I'm fascinated by how religions educate people. And one of the things that, uh, how religions educate, is they keep repeating things, okay? Um, in the modern world, when you're educated, you go to university when you're 20, 21, 22, you sit in a classroom, a teacher tells you something, and they just fill you up with some knowledge, like a jug of water. They pour the jug of knowledge into your head. And then the idea is, you will remember these lessons for the next 40 years. After one session, 40 years. Now, religions know that is crazy. If you want someone to remember something, you have to tell them something maybe 10 or 15 times a day, otherwise they will forget. And that's why all the religions have us praying all the time, from morning till night, because they know that what you knew at 10 o'clock in the morning, you'll forget at lunchtime. So you need it at lunch, you need it at breakfast, you need it in the evening, otherwise you will forget. 
They also know that you have to have calendars, that you can't just give someone a book and tell them to go away and read it. This won't really change them. You need to structure the calendar. So if you look at everything, Buddhism, Catholicism, Judaism, they all have calendars. They have moments of the year where you are supposed to think of something. Uh, in Ju Judaism, in the Jewish calendar, we've just had now the festival of Birkat Hilahot. On this festival, you go out with a rabbi into the fields and you look at the first blossom on the trees and you say prayers to God to thank him for springtime, for the beauty of the springtime. Um, and you say some poetry and, uh, uh, and you say some prayers. Now you could say, I don't need religion to remind me of this, I'll just do this on my own. I'll pick up a book of poems and I'll wander out into the countryside. The problem is we don't because we forget, because there's something great on our smartphone, because there's something nice on TV. We don't focus on, on the springtime, but we do within a religious structure. So my question is, when you do away with religion, what reminders are there of the things that religions used to teach us about? What reminders are there of things that we need in our souls, but that the surrounding environment doesn't uh, help us with? You know, think of Zen Buddhism. Once a year, Zen Buddhists want us to look at the moon. There's the famous festival of moon viewing in the autumn, when with friends you go out into the fields and the countryside and you look up at the moon and you're eating rice cakes and you're saying poems and it's a festival of friendship and uh, it's a beautiful festival. Now, you could say you don't need Zen Buddhism to look at the moon. Anyone can look at the moon at any time. The problem is we don't because we need an agenda. We need the inner life to have a calendar outside so that we will have an appointment, not just with our friends, not just with our business associates, but with the most important ideas in the world. The most important ideas will be forgotten unless they are in our calendars. And it's so far only religions that have been good at doing that. Religions have also been fascinating in realizing that if you want to seduce an audience, if you want an audience to listen to you, you have to make it exciting. That's why religions use music, they use fantastic architecture, and they use fantastic speakers. You know, if you think of the way in which Catholicism particularly has invested in the art of oratory, they will give you amazing speeches. And at the end of a speech, you think, yes, I want to follow this because it was said nicely. If you listen to most university professors, they sit like this, they speak in a not very clear voice. They're not trying to seduce you. They are not entertainers. Religions are, they understand enough about entertainment to realize that if you want to touch someone deeply, you have to learn how to speak well and how to entertain. This is part of being a serious person. In the modern world, we have the serious people who can't speak, who can't communicate, and then we have the brilliant communicators who are on television all the time and they know how to do this brilliantly, but they don't have anything very substantial to tell us. So we need a uniting of the best communicators with the highest messages. You know, the other thing we need to do desperately is to practice to be good. Now, this sounds very weird. You know, if I said to you, if someone said to you, you know, how, how are you doing? Uh, what, are your, what are your ambitions? I said, you know, this week I want to practice how to be a good person. I think, what? What's wrong with you? If I say to somebody, I want to practice to be healthy. I want to build up my muscles. I want to learn to jog. Oh yeah, no problem. But if I say, I want to learn to be a better human being, this sounds very strange. Why? Because we have no idea of self-improvement. The very idea of self-improvement is very odd. Um, in religions, of course, self-improvement is absolutely core. And the idea is we constantly need to practice at being good. We need to practice virtue. And that's why all the religions make lists of kinds of behavior that we need to remember to, to be. We need to be kind, we need empathy, we need generosity, we need patience, we need a sense of humor. These things are so important, and unless we have them, as we, unless we're reminded of them all the time, we will forget. Now, in the modern world, there are no reminders of goodness. We have no public system of reminding us to be good. The idea sounds totally strange. I think that's wrong. Uh, in England, through the School of Life, this year, I started something called the Virtue Project, where what we did was to take a whole list of virtues, very ordinary ones, non-religious ones. Um, we looked at resilience, we looked at patience, we looked at empathy, um, 
We looked at sacrifice, we looked at humor, hope, forgiveness. And we made a campaign, we persuaded an advertising agency to put posters all over London reminding people of how to behave. And this had a huge amount of impact on social media, etc. because suddenly people thought, yes, I try to be a good person, but sometimes I need a little bit of a reminder in order actually to be good, a, a, a good person. What I'm really saying is we need a lot of help in being good, virtuous, wise, calm people. It used to be that we got help from religions. For many people now, religion has become impossible. We then said, okay, we will find this in culture. We built museums. We sent young ladies to study French literature. It hasn't worked because we are treating this like a hobby. We are treating something that should be the meaning of life as an elegant pastime for the weekend. We don't have this at the center of our culture. What we need is the brightest minds in technology to unite with those who know about wisdom, to create applications both in the real world and in the online world that will create meaningful content that will not just help us to communicate, but will help us to communicate about the most important things. So what I'm looking for is a moment when we can unite technology with wisdom and meaning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insightful speech. Uh, 뭐 이렇게 우리가 일상에서 마주하는 고민 같은 것들을 이렇게 우리나라에서뿐만이 아니라 전 세계적으로 아주 그 많은 인기를 끌고 있는 작가이자 철학자입니다. 실제로 트위터 팔로워가 30만 명이 넘는데 여기에 3분의 1 정도가 우리나라 여성분들이라고 합니다. 좀 놀랍죠. 지금 뭐 웃는 분들 보면은 이, 이 지금 오늘 이른 아침부터 모신 객석에 앉아 있는 분들 보면은 이제까지 서울 디지털 포럼에 오셨던 분들과 비교해서 성비가 굉장히 다릅니다. 대부분 여자분들 많이 앉아 계시는데 뭐 좋습니다. 오늘 대담은요. 어좀 재밌게 한번 진행을 해 보겠습니다. 빈칸 채워 느끼시게 대담입니다. 한번 보시죠. 어 저희가 미리 25세에서 60세 전국 남녀 성인들을 대상으로 해서 오픈 서베이를 사용해서 알랭드 보통 씨에게 궁금한 것들 뭐 이런 것들을 어, 특히나 협력과 관련해서 초협력과 관련해서 설문조사를 해봤습니다. 아, 자, 아, 이제 알랭드 보통 씨와 함께 어, 빈칸 끼워넣기식 대담을 한번 진행을 해보겠습니다. Are you ready? Okay. 아, 자, 첫 번째 질문 한번 보실까요? 지금 자 화면에 나오고 있습니다. 내가 일어나자마자 제일 먼저 하는 것 또는 생각하는 것 뭔지 일단 그 대중들이 설문에 응답하신 분들이 어떤 생각을 하고 계신지 먼저 우선 좀 알아보겠습니다. 답을 한번 줘 보시죠. 자, 보시면은 <웃음> 출근한다가 가장 많았습니다. 뭐 당연하죠. 어, 그 다음으로 my girlfriend 여자친구 생각을 한다. 뭐 좋습니다. 그럼 남자들은 그렇겠지만 여자는 또 남자친구 생각하겠죠. 그다음에 커피를 마신다. 저는 말이죠. 오늘 아침에 일어나서 매일 그렇습니다만은 어제 뉴스 시청률이 어떻게 나왔는지 고민을 합니다. 오늘도 대충 안도의 한숨을 쉬고 돌아왔는데 알랭드 보통 씨, 아침에 일어나서 제일 먼저 하는 일이 뭔가요? Well, um, when I wake up, uh, my thoughts are in confusion from the dream world in which I've spent the last eight hours or so. So my mind is confused and I want to bring order to my thoughts. And for me, the way to order my thoughts is writing. And uh, I don't have pen and paper near me uh, in bed, but what I do have near me is my smartphone, and um, particularly Twitter. So I immediately write about five tweets every morning, and any of you, w of you who do follow me on Twitter will know that at about six o'clock London time, 
almost every day, six tweets will come on the screen. And they are my attempts to clear my mind and to digest the thoughts of the previous day and to capture them in a kind of aphorism. Um, and so that's, that's what I will do, to clear my mind with a few tweets. 그 트위터에 대해서 그 대답을 해오는 댓글을 붙이는 일반인들의 의견들을 얼마나 많이 보십니까? Um, well, I get retweets, but I'm a very horrible person on Twitter in that I don't really believe in communicating. I, I believe it is a broadcast medium. Oh. So I know some people, I get letters, particularly from California, going, you are a bad person. <laughs> you are supposed to reply to everyone. I always reply to anyone who emails me on my website, but I don't use Twitter like that because I always think other people are not interested in my responses to a selective other. So I, I like to have it for everybody and uh, just make a list of my tweets. 그럼 트위터 사용이라는 거를 일종의 어, 나 자신과의 소통 이렇게 생각을 하면 되겠군요. Yes, yes, it's, a, it's kind of self-therapy. And also, you know, it's kind of like a, a collection of wise sayings. Um, but they're often quite crazy. I, I got into trouble yesterday because I, I, I wrote a tweet um, saying that the proof of being a good parent, the proof of being a good parent is that your child does not want to be famous. Um, and I, I argue this as a way of thinking about where the desire, where the hunger to be famous comes from. And I, the, the argument is that people want to be famous because their parents haven't loved them properly. So I say, if you are a good parent, your child will not want to be famous. And uh, I had lots of parents sweeting me going, that's not fair. My child wants to be on television, but he's nice, really. And uh, you, are, you are a mean person. But anyway, we'll see. 네, 좋습니다. 자, 그럼 두 번째 질문으로 넘어가겠습니다. 보여주시죠. 현대 사회에서 우리에게 가장 큰 위안을 주는 것은 뭐뭐다? 자, 이건 먼저 알랭드 보통 씨의 답을 먼저 들어볼까요? 현대 사회에서 가장 큰 위안을 우리에게 주는 것은 뭐라고 생각하십니까? Um, look, I think for me, uh, the biggest source of consolation and comfort is art and love. And I think that if you look at what unites art and love, it's the feeling that we are not lonely. When you read a book, for me, my favorite books are books that I read and I feel, ah, the author is describing an emotion or a feeling that is deeply mine, but that I was not able to understand or see as clearly without the help of this person's book. So a book written by someone else helps me to know myself better. And there's a similar moment, I think, in the best moments in relationships, in love, when somebody says something to you and you understand yourself better as a result. You are less lonely. I think you know, one of the great tragedies of life is loneliness, feeling that one's feelings have no echo in other people. And in their different ways, art and love are um, solutions to the problem of loneliness. Uh,家族が非常に多いですね。あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ、あ
because we want respect. In a way, we want love. We want to be treated kindly. And what we are very afraid of is humiliation. Humiliation is what we are trying to run away from desperately. 알랭드 버튼께서 우리나라에 대해서 얼마나 관심을 갖고 지켜보셨는지 모르겠지만 지금 말씀하신 스테이터스 앵자이티 어떤 지위 자기의 지위에 대한 그 욕심이라는 게 어, 서구 사회에서도 그렇게 마찬가지입니까? 우리는 우리한테 심하다고 생각을 하는데. Um, yes, I think it is a modern global phenomenon. The interesting thing is that every country I go to thinks it's only them. So we are even lonely about thinking that this is the modern problem. And I'll tell you exactly why it happens. There are clear historic reasons. In traditional societies, people do not move between ranks. You are born a farmer, you die a farmer. Your father was a blacksmith, you will be a blacksmith. Nowadays, you grow up in Korea or in New York or in London, and the school system tells, me, tells you, you can be anything, anything you like. The, the sky is the limit. You could be the president, you could be Bill Gates, and it's a beautiful idea, and it drives us crazy. Because we think, oh, I'm not everything. I'm not yet Bill Gates. Oh, I've failed. I, I'm going to kill myself because I have not yet reached the pinnacle. The chances of becoming Bill Gates are as small statistically as winning the lottery or being the king of France in the 17th century. It is totally unlikely. And yet we have this, mo this, this message that, no, no, it's totally possible. And if you read these self-help books, you know, Korean bookstores are full of self-help books. How to make a million dollars this week, how to expand your portfolio, how to be a better manager, how to win. And then there are all these other kinds of books, all of them come from America, and they tell you how do you cope with depression, with low self-esteem, with a sense of, no, of not feeling like you have any self-worth. The two kinds of books are related. A society that tells people, you can have anything, well, they're gonna have 90% of people going, oh, what happened to me? It didn't work out. The dream didn't work out. Um, what we desperately need is to be honest with ourselves about how many people in this society will so-called succeed, and we also need to look at that word success and realize that, you know, if I said there's a very successful person over there, they're about to come on stage, come on stage, successful person, you would think this was somebody who was very rich, who was famous, who had done well in business. That's what you all think. But if I said, come on, very successful person, and I showed you a woman of 80 who was not attractive, who had a kind face, and who would help to raise two generations of people and who knew about life in all sorts of ways, and I said, this is success. You would go, really? It's just a friendly grandmother. And I said, no, friendly grandmothers hold society together. It's because we don't have enough friendly grandmothers that career is falling apart. You would go, really? I thought that we, we needed more celebrities. And you go, no, 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 it's not a celebrity problem we have. We have a kindness problem, a wisdom problem, and a richer sense of who deserves high status problem. High status should be much more widely spread than it is now. And we are being driven crazy by a status system that rewards only a very few people for only a very few skills. 알겠습니다. 자, 그럼 다음 질문으로 또 넘어갈까요? 한번 보시죠. 자, 우리에게 가장 필요한 기술은 뭐뭐다? 이것도 답부터 보겠습니다. 답을 한번 보여주시죠. 자, 커뮤니케이션, 소통이 나왔고요. 그 다음으로 IT 정보 기술이 나왔습니다. 자 구석에 마인드 리딩, 뭐 독심술 같은 것도 나왔는데 뭐 그건 그냥 웃고 넘어가면 될것 같고요. 자 커뮤니케이션과 IT 정보 기술은 뭐 같은 의미라고 봐도 되지 않겠나 싶습니다. 그만큼 우리가 IT 정보 기술을 이용한 소통을 많이 절실하게 생각을 하고 있다는 뜻으로 해석이 되는데요. 알랭드 보통 씨는 뭐라고 생각하십니까? Yes, look, I'm, I'm very interested in communication. But when um, tech people talk about communication, they mean uh, smaller phones, smarter phones, long distance communication, spreading of data. The one thing they don't talk about is communication in the way that a philosopher or a psychoanalyst would mm. talk about it. We don't know how to talk to one another. We know how to t make a telephone call. We know how to call, you know, Vladivostok and uh, Beijing and uh, New York on telephones. No problem there anymore. Samsung has solved this for us around the planet. What we don't know how to do is to explain to our wife or husband that we're a little bit unhappy about something. That kind of communication goes very wrong. 
people lose their temper. How do you mean you're unhappy? Um, how do you mean you, you like the other person? How do you mean, etc.? We don't know how to communicate with our parents, with our bosses, in the true sense. We know how to talk, but we don't know what to talk about in order to communicate the deepest parts of ourselves. So as I said in my talk, the real challenge of anybody in the communication industry is to work out ways not just of making communication faster and cheaper and smaller, but how to make it psychologically more effective. And I would love the brightest brains in technology to set themselves the challenge of how to make sure that parents can speak to their children, mm -hmm. speak properly to their children, and lovers can speak to their lovers, and colleagues can speak to their employees properly. This is what we need the help of technology for. We've done enough. It's great that we can speak to New York and Vladivostok. That's fantastic, and we needed that. We now need to look at the way in which technology can serve the human need of communication. 알겠습니다. 저 스스로 많이 반성하게 되는 얘기가 아닌가 싶은데 소통과 정보 기술을 사람들이 원한다는 건 사실은 더 뒤집어서 생각을 해보면 은 기술보다는 그러니까 소위 테크놀로지보다는 내가 다른 사람과 진심으로 소통하는 그런 방법이 더 중요하다는 말로 이해를 해도 될것 같습니다. 자, 그러면 다음엔 거꾸로 된 질문입니다. 질문 좀 보여주시죠. 어, 우리에게 그러면 은 가장 불필요한 기술은 뭐다? <웃음> 뭐라고 생각하십니까? Um. I think the technology that distracts us from um, understanding ourselves and setting our goals. You know, I, I, I'm amazed by how there's almost a conspiracy nowadays to put music and screens everywhere so that we are never alone with our own thoughts, that we are always distracted. I was in a taxi in London, and the driver said, oh, look at my new gadget. I've got a whole big television in the back of the screen. I said, please, can I switch this television off? I want to spend a few minutes thinking about myself and my projects. I don't want to look at a television screen. The guy said, no, no, you can't switch this off. Customers love it. You go on to Korean Air, and there you are for 10 hours. It used to be a wonderful moment to look out of the plane window, look at the clouds, think there's a screen in front of you. It wants to watch films. In other words, everywhere we go, we are surrounded by information from others. And if we are always surrounded by ideas from others, we cannot have our own ideas. For thousands of years, there was a place called the monastery. You escaped from the city and went to the monastery because you needed to be alone with your own thoughts. We've done away with the monastery, but more than ever, what we need is moments, moments, not a whole life, but moments of silence, moments when it, it's a chance to develop our own thoughts. And we need technology that understands that we don't always need to be distracted. And if technology is always distracting us with the latest headlines, the latest messages, um, we will become uncreative, sterile, unimaginative people. Our economy will, will suffer. So we need help in finding silence. 알겠습니다. 그럼 일반 대중들은 어떤 생각을 이제 답을 한번 보시죠. <웃음> 필요하지 않은 기술이란 없다. 그 다음으로는 정보 기술 뭐 이렇게 생각을 했는데요. 알랭드 보통지 생각하신 거하고는 조금 거리가 있었던 것 같습니다. 아마도 뭐. 어, 스마트폰이나 욕심이나 전쟁 기술이나 이런 것들이 좀 없었으면 좋겠다는 생각이 어느 정도 일치한 생각이 아닌가 싶습니다. 다음 질문으로 넘어가 있습니다. 자, 질문은 나에게 가장 큰 경쟁 상대는 누구냐? 일단 대중들의 답부터 먼저 보겠습니다. Myself, 자신. 그만큼 힘들게 산다는 얘기겠죠, 다들? 어, 다음으로는 동료나 아, 뭐, everyone, 모든 사람이란 아, 그런 대답이 나왔습니다. 어떻게 생각하시나요? Um, I think my biggest rival is anyone who is doing something that I want to do. And the moment that I know I have a rival is when you get that funny feeling in your stomach or in your mind when you meet someone and they tell you what you do and you feel envy. Now, envy is a really difficult subject, because if you're a good person, you're not supposed to feel envy. Envy, you know, very bad. And people will always say, no, I'm not an envious person. Well, we are all of us envious, and we should be. Envy is a wonderful emotion, because without envy, we don't know what we should be ambitious about. Every time you meet someone, they tell you what they're doing, and you feel envious, this is a clue 
to what you should do with your future. So use envy as a guide to where you want to go next. So nowadays, whenever I meet someone and they make me feel envious, rather than trying to escape the feeling of envy, I get down, I write on a piece of paper, and I think, okay, why do I feel envious of them? Is it how they look? Is it the job they're doing? What aspect of their job? Um, what, what, is it that, what is it that I could use? So learn to steal from the people you're envious about. Don't run away from envy, learn from envy. 근데 질투만 하다가 그냥 혼자 화병이 나는 경우가 워낙 많아서 어떻게 될지 모르겠습니다. 고맙습니다. 자, 다음 질문으로 넘어가겠습니다. 자, 나는 어떤 사람과 꼭 함께 일해 보고 싶다. 이것도 역시 어, 대중의 답을 먼저 들어보겠습니다. 친구. 뭐 아무래도 그렇겠죠. 그 다음으로 대통령. 어, 스티브 잡스. 어, 이건 이제 불가능하게 됐을 것 같고. 사실 이 질문을 듣는 분들이 도대체 이 질문은 나한테 왜 하나 물어봐서 그 알랭드 보통 씨와 함께 한다고 어, 알았으면 답이 친구, 적어도 친구 다음으로 알랭드 보통 씨로 나왔을 텐데 어, 그렇게 못하게 된 점은 좀 아쉽습니다. 어, 자, 가장 같이 일해보고 싶은 사람이 누구다라는 질문에 대해서 uh, 어떻게 대답하시겠습니까? Uh, look, the, the area of collaboration that I'm really interested in is, you know, I'm a writer, a person of ideas. And um, what I'm more and more aware of is I would like to collaborate with people who can make ideas powerful in the world. So I like to collaborate with anyone who is able to, to take ideas and put them into the world in different ways. That means people who are involved in technology, people who are involved in education, people who are involved in government. These are, for me, always exciting moments of collaboration. And I've had little moments of this. Uh, I was doing some work with uh, the Prime Minister in, in London. I've done some work with companies. Um, I've done some work with technology uh, people, trying all the time to say, OK, I'm interested in wisdom and uh, how to live, and how can we take this outside of books, outside of the university, and make it powerful in the world. In Korea, I tell you exactly what I would love to collaborate. I would love to collaborate with some people who want to set up the school of life in Korea. I would love to find collaborators who can come to me and say, OK, you have the content, you know what this school is about, we will help to provide the capital and know-how to make it work in Korea. That would, for me, would be a beautiful and interesting collaboration. So anyone who is inspired, come and talk to me. <웃음> 알겠습니다. 자, 다음 질문으로 넘어가겠습니다. 자, 나에게 스마트폰은 뭐뭐다? 이것 역시 어, 응답자들의 질, 답을 먼저 듣고 알랭드 보통 씨에게 넘어가겠습니다. 나에게 스마트폰은 친구다. 가장 많았고요. 필수품이다. 인생이다. 뭐 도구다. 뭐이 정도까지 답이 나왔습니다. 스마트폰이라는 게 전화인데 폰, 전화기라는 대답은 가장 적은 대답 중에 하나였네요. 알랭드 보통 씨에게는 스마트폰은 어떤 의미를 갖고 있습니까? Yes, my um, look, my phone is the place where I write my books. Um, for a lot of the time, I, I still have a keyboard, I still have a BlackBerry. I know I'm not allowed to mention that company in Korea, but I have a BlackBerry uh, phone that I like simply because of its keyboard. And um, people are always thinking I'm on my phone all the time, texting friends or whatever. But I'm just, um, I use it as a notebook. And um, so it's always with me. And I just write bits of my uh, books on it. I find that ideas never come when they're supposed to. Uh, when you sit down and you have a free morning to write, that's the worst time. But just at, you know, when you're food shopping or when you're going to the airport, that's the moment when suddenly the idea will come and I get my smartphone and I put it uh, uh, on there. So if you see me on my smartphone, don't think I'm being rude. I'm just trying to write the next bit of my book. <laughs> 그렇다면 이제 마지막 질문입니다만 아까도 말씀하실 때뭐 예를 들어서 이 일상의 복잡함 같은 걸 피하기 위해서 어, 수도원 같은 데로 도망까지 가는 그런 사람들의 얘기도 잠깐 하셨는데 스마트폰을 비롯한 소위 이 첨단 IT 기기, 네트워크 이런 것들이 우리가 수, 어, 정말 마음을 열고 소통하고 콜라보레이션을 하고 이러는데 방해가 된다고 생각을 하십니까? 또 도움이 될수 있는 방법을 찾을 수도 있다고 보십니까? Um, well, look, I think one of the things that smartphones can do is to time, um, is to connect us with time uh, to certain ideas. So, you know, if there was um, 
if your phone rang at a certain moment and said, right, this is your moment where you're going to spend 10 minutes meditating. This is your 10-minute meditation moment of the day. Um, and your phone insisted that you did this, and it cleared everything. It stopped messages coming, and it, and it then produced an image, a beautiful image of uh, you know, a cherry blossom. And it said, right, is it time for meditating? My f the phone will itself go dead until you have meditated for 10 minutes. You think, okay, so it was steering you in a good direction. So a phone is just a diagnostic tool that can direct us to what it thinks is most important. Up till now, that means any message from anyone at any time, and that is not the most important. So we simply need to reprogram our phones to make them calendars of the most important ideas and attitudes, and you can do that with a phone. 알겠습니다. 자, 고맙습니다. 자, 이렇게 알랭드 보통 씨와 아주 재밌는 일상에 관한 어, 일문일답 다이얼로그를 나눠봤는데요. 좀 시간이 더 있었으면 더 많이 준비된 질문들이 있는데 어, 시간 관계상에서 줄여야 될것 같습니다. 이제 알랭 보통 씨 보내드려야 되겠죠? 고맙습니다, 알랭 보통 씨. Thank you very much for your insightful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thank you. Thank you.